Ukrainian resilience and fight for freedom. This is Media Center Ukraine. My name is Vasily Samakhvalo. We start our special event discussion on volunteering, uh, what it used to be half a year ago and what it is now and what is going to be tomorrow. Um, let me introduce our guests today. Oksana Dostakivska, head of the Regional Office of International Renaissance Foundation, Evelina Korilets, executive director at Razum for Ukraine Charity Foundation, Halina Burdun, advisor to the head of Lviv Oblast Military Administration, chair of the Medical and Psychological Support Working Group. Is that correct? Yeah. Thank you. And Andri Saluk, a volunteer and founder of Lviv's Night Civic Initiative. And uh, last but not least, Melania Podolia, coordinator and manager of NEST project of Serhii Pretulas Foundation in Lviv. Welcome. I'll start off with a very simple question. Yesterday, our volunteer group met with the leadership of uh, Verkhovna Rada of Ukraine, where they raised an issue that we need to address uh, some pressing issues that complicate the life of volunteer movement. What is volunteer movement today? Let me begin. Speaking of us, for us, this is month six in the railway station of Lviv. We got organized uh, very fast, uh, starting from 16 people. At the end of March, there were 1,000 people, and at the end of April, there were 1,500 people. So these were very responsible people, uh, physicians, uh, mental health providers, and people who were physically accompanying people, meaning uh, some people needed caring, because unfortunately, there are no ramps on the railway station. Uh, until today, and physically we had to carry some people so that they can move on. Obstacles. Speaking of obstacles, in March um, nothing um, created the obstacle because this was that was the initiative of people who were moving fast and moving naturally. Today there are no obstacles left. Maybe there are fewer of us. Uh, there are 500 to 600 volunteers working at the moment, but. Uh, the issue is the readiness of society, whether we are ready to continue. Speaking of obstacles, there are none. There are maybe some bureaucratic uh, issues, um, but these are natural things and uh, probably they have some history. And speaking of communication and uh, uh, working with structural divisions, structural departments, so this is maybe information, communication and accessibility and also security issues. Thank you. We are going to talk about bureaucracy and the government later, who is going to be next. Uh, let me talk about our fund, Razom for Ukraine Charity Foundation. We consolidate a series of projects starting from emergency. The idea is to support our warriors, tactical medicine. This is support to medical facilities, hospitals and uh, communities. Um, we have a logistics system in place that takes uh, equipment from the warehouse of Lviv to the final consumer. There are some historic projects that have been uh, up and running. So uh, this is the support of children with SMA. Uh, a new project, this is psychological consultation to family members whose uh, Family members are now warriors and protecting their motherland. This is support to internally displaced people. This is working with the parents who lost their children um, in the war. Um, Top Drive this is yet another beautiful project uh, that uh, supports uh, um, families with many children and families whose uh, fathers, brothers uh, are servicemen. We also have a, a major grant project where we support uh, smaller funds. We provide financial assistance. And this is great because sometimes you can't find people who you trust and you can't find uh, funds that you trust. 
Our principle is that money should not sit in the bank account, same as tourniquet should not sit in the warehouse. If we know that money is going to help save life, then we are going to channel this money. So you were very effective using your time talking about the activity of your foundation. What is volunteer movement as of today? There are two questions for that answer. We have a lot of um, great funds, for example, Pritulas Foundation, where I have the honor to work. It's not so difficult to work for us because we have a lot of manpower. We have a few sectors of our activity. We don't decide what we do. These are the servicemen who decide what we should do. We have very good line of communication. So there are no issues what to buy, why we need to buy it. So we understand each other half word. Um, speaking of uh, SUVs, um, uh, and other equipment that they need. The structure of our foundation is very flexible. The problem is that this is military foundation and uh, there is certain policy, understanding, and unfortunately we cannot um, raise funds for other projects, though it's not impossible. There are also other smaller initiatives um, which um, gather smaller teams. They probably have uh, um, not that complicated programs and problems. They are more mobile, they are more flexible. We actually used to be flexible ourselves, and I, I believe we are still flexible. But because of certain things that we buy, sometimes it takes time before the commodity arrives. Smaller funds are mobile and they are swift and they are flexible. But governmental bureaucracy is uh, the catastrophic uh, obstacle for them. I understand uh, what, what they are going through and I feel their pain, but our foundation, their foundation, uh, other foundations, uh, when we were only starting uh, to buy things, our friends were already delivering this commodity from other countries. Uh, vo volunteering movement is great, uh, foundations keep working, they keep reporting, uh, etc. Once we expand and get bigger, we lose this flexibility. There are smaller funds that are more flexible, but sometimes uh, they face obstacles in terms of governmental decisions that are poorly communicated. But this triangle volunteers, government, and uh, the end consumer that is serviceman. So it's very well balanced. Military volunteer as of today is a job. I'm going to talk about that later on because uh, society sees volunteers differently. By the way, I'm a linguist and I am a supporter of descriptive approach, when the word gains the meaning in the process. Shoemaker, for example, so that uh, used to be um, a Formula One driver, but now anybody who drives fast is a shoemaker. Things change these days, and I believe that uh, military volunteer has also acquired additional connotation. It's a very interesting thing, but let's talk about that later. If you allow me, I'd like to say that I'm not the representative of the volunteer movement, unlike my colleagues. We work with non-governmental organizations and volunteer movement. And I agree that uh, we probably need to talk about definitions, but what's important for us is to understand that the strength of our country is the strength of the horizontal connections and ties. And volunteer is one of the brightest examples in this paradigm. If we ask ourselves a question, what has changed from the outbreak of the war until today, I'd like to talk about a few trends. First of all, volunteers have professional occupation because we know 
who does what and who doesn't do what, who to approach, who we should not approach. Maybe this was a painful transformation. Sometimes we were being hated, sometimes we were being humiliated, but as of today, we have more or less professional niche of uh, volunteer movement. We know who is in charge of what and who can do what. Secondly, we also know that uh, we need to develop sustainability of these initiatives. We got organized once and uh, we managed to take a person from point A to point B. That's great. That was the challenge and we met it. But now we need sustainability because the problems that we uh, solve are long-term problems and we need uh, survivability and sustainability. And thirdly, this is vision of the changes. And occasionally, especially, it's important when we are talking about volunteer initiatives and organizations that emerged locally and uh, were like self-organized organizations, how can they uh, ensure that there is no governmental intrusion and control? because the government changed uh, the amount of money that we can gather using the pay cards, debit cards. But not all organizations know how to do the proper accounting and how to do the inventory. We are going to talk about that later, whether the government is the good or the evil. Back to what I was saying, this is the great um, challenge because it's also related to sustainability and occupational um, character of uh, uh, volunteer movement. But we need to learn how to cooperate with the government and how to work within the framework of effective um, legislation, although some methods are really frightening. Andri, um, I represent Lviv's Night Civic Initiative. Uh, we've been working for nine years. This is our ninth year, by the way. We started in March um, 2014, we were working with the uh, optics, uh, devices, equipment, etc. You are asking what has changed. Uh, uh, sadly, nothing has changed. Nothing has changed uh, in the government because the devices, and that was the um, uh, optic vision devices and uh, um, all sorts of equipment. So they were needed back then and they are still needed today. So it was a known fact what servicemen need in the front line. The government keeps saying that we are going to support volunteer movement. We don't need your support. The servicemen, the soldiers need your support because they have to fight, win, and survive. When we are talking about institutionalization of volunteer movement, uh, are we going to fight uh, until the rest of our lives? Personally, I want that Ukraine wins this war, and I want to get back to what I had been doing before the war broke out. That was the uh, protection of national heritage. I don't want to be the warrior all my life. We are talking about this triangle, uh, volunteers, government, and armed forces. I'm against this triangle. I think that there should be just armed forces and the government. We can send letters to our servicemen to provide them moral support, but this is abnormal normal that we have to gather money for the drones, for vehicles, etc. So I think that a lot has been put on the shoulders of volunteers. You do things, we will regulate things, we will help you. We don't need your help. Do what you had to do back in 2014. Uh, provide the army with all they need and then us volunteers will not have to gather money for the things that the government has to gather money for. A volunteer movement also exists in successful developed countries. I agree with you. I am ready to work as a volunteer protecting national heritage and uh, architectural uh, values. But what Lviv Knights does, so this is um, headsets, active headsets, uh, uh, binoculars, uh, optic vision devices, etc. It's not normal because it's not part of our usual activity. We are working with different communities and um, as Oksana said, uh, not all communities are sustainable and not all communities are ready to take the responsibility. Our 
key message is to communicate, to understand the needs, uh, where to send the person to the shelter, to the hospital, and whether the shelter is ready to open the door for that person. What's missing today is that um, these days there are a lot of initiative people who share their contacts, but then they go missing. And we hope that we can uh, contact that person, but unfortunately they are not there. So. We have got three people on our staff who verify whether the contact is still effective. Because, for example, some people welcome somebody to welcome to host somebody, and once we bring the person, and the person is not there. Today, volunteer is um, a fashionable job, a stylish job, it's a trendy job, and lots of cars had this label volunteer on their windshield. Because Everybody was a volunteer, so uh, sometimes you go through the checkpoint and uh, the uh, serviceman on the checkpoint says that you are the 30th volunteer car that is driving to the railway station. Sometimes um, we, had, um, we, we face security issues and we need to involve uh, law enforcement in cooperation. When we are talking about security, safety and volunteer movements, so this is a very thin line because it's great responsibility. We as volunteers, we work in a very narrow niche. So we provide fast assistance to people, stabilization, medical assistance, etc. The circle of people who are ready to do it systematically, and mind you, this is month six of the war. Of course, I want the war to be over. I agree with Andre that we need to get back to our usual pace of life, because I did not plan to do that until today. And uh, sometimes you need to approach people who you trust, and they approach people who they trust, and then they come back and they do what you do. But this is our job on a daily basis, without weekends, 12 hours a day. We are burning out, and we are getting Getting exhausted. You're talking about um, sustainability, institutionalization, etc. Do you think that volunteers should be a job and we need to overcome two stigmas? People who are volunteers, so they face the choice that they need to earn money and they need to get remuneration for what they do, otherwise they won't survive. And uh, second is uh, if volunteers make money so how, how can we manage this if you allow me recently i was a volunteer who was um, in charge of uh, scoliosis issues sma issues etc so that was something that was close to me and i was really concerned about that but i didn't have to do it full time that was just my passion what i do now it's still my passion because there is always a choice but it's more about what I'm going to be tomorrow, where I'm going to live and whether the country is going to exist, where my family is going to be, my child, my nearest and dearest. Speaking of volunteer movement as a job, I believe that most of us volunteered before the war, back in 2014, before the full-scale invasion. Um, our drivers, our regional council members, uh, our handlers uh, who work in the warehouses uh, these are the drivers or, or members of lviv city council we also have uh, professional physicians i never could have thought that i would need to understand the frequencies of different radio stations um how different uh, unmanned uh, um, systems are different uh, from each other. We all had hoped that it would take a few weeks, um, max uh, half a year. Now we understand that there is no time limit, unfortunately. The only time limit is our victory. Volunteers need food, they need to pay bills, they need to buy clothes, they need to support their families, they need to pay medical bills, they need to see the doctor. Therefore, I know that a lot of international organizations, they have uh, 
individual programs that support volunteer movements and organizations um, and their administrative and overhead so that uh, people working in those funds have uh, um, a remuneration, they can pay their bills, etc. And it's very important because me as the director of the foundation, if I lose a professional volunteer, it's a pain because you need to develop uh, the staff. You need to teach them how to use software. It's the whole organism. And this organism uh, is very complicated and it takes time to learn how it works it's important and the time is ripe that volunteer volunteer movement becomes a job and volunteer is an occupation we have a rule that volunteers cannot be involved uh, in volunteer movement more than three times a day because we have shifts 12 hours day shift 12 hours night shift on the side note, um, we have um, the system of the shift managers who coordinate all the shifts. Uh, so there is also a senior physician, senior healthcare providers, they coordinate their activities, etc. When I'm talking to the shift managers and I say, do we keep going? They say, yes, until the war um, is over. We got a lot of young people who found support, good team, and just a good circle of friends in order to self-develop and self-realize themselves. I send them on vacation because they burn out psychologically. It's a great challenge because they see very difficult stories on a daily basis. We have administrators who build the teams and who watch each member of the team. Another important thing is uh, there is a group of people who I trained, I taught them how to build the teams, uh, how to get access to the system, uh, how to report to the shift manager. But I understand that September comes, people get back to work, those who were on vacation, and I understand that I will probably need to look for additional manpower, additional staff. We had volunteers who had been living in Germany for 20 years. They came to Lviv. Uh, after their visit, they wrote a big article in one of the German newspapers papers and they actually awed at what we do they were amazed uh, at what we do i got calls from germany a few times they checked who we are our contacts our history and uh, their feedback was you can't go on like that you need support therefore the question whether we need support yes two weeks ago i was uh, trying to raise my voice that we need food, we need regular meals, because it's important, physical condition of people is important. Uh, resources are scarce. Even people who had been saying that it's very important, I'm going to do more now than I did in March. Um, in March, of course, that was the wave of volunteer movement. In April, May, it started subsiding. Things got worse in June and July. And when I say that I have 500 volunteers, they say, you are happy. But I understand that September is around the corner and I need the team um, to continue working. And volunteers also need uh, uh, money to pay for their um, public transportation, for their bus fares, for their tickets. Um, they do good things and they need help. When the person is taking the responsibility and becoming the volunteer, they sacrifice time, they sacrifice re resources. Uh, but we also make sure that each of our volunteers also have a at least part-time job or are they a student, what they do on a daily basis, because if they only do volunteer jobs, so they burn out. And uh, education, job and volunteer movement, this is important, but we need to uh, cover some of volunteers' expenses. I have three things to say. I'm going to be positive today. I don't see a big tragedy here that um, volunteer movement exists in Ukraine the way it is 
now. I understand that the Ministry of Defense had to do their job, but if we look at the funds, there are two major funds, Come Back Alive and Pretulas Fund. We probably do not cover all the budget of the Ministry of Defense, maybe 1%, but we are not in competition with them. Volunteer movement is a hard job. It's been six months that I have been deprived of food, sleep, and I don't feel at my best. But people want to belong, they want to be involved, they want to be dedicated. And even if people volunteer two times a month, it's great because they learn and they contribute. Um, institutionalization of this movement, I doubt it. When, when we are talking about remuneration of the job of uh, um, volunteers, there is, for example, one uh, foundation that has a steering committee and the supervisory committee, and they uh, use part of their donations in order to remunerate the work of the volunteers. We don't do that, but we cover part of the expenses of our volunteers. And I believe this is the right thing. There are also grant programs, and there are a lot of great programs that uh, help cover some overheads and institutional expenses. But things are not as pathetic as they might look. Uh, volunteers offer their supportive shoulder to the government. Uh, and we want to be involved. Uh, we want to be part of decision makers. Uh, I understand that we are not influencers, but if we look at the work of Ukrainian volunteers and when they look back, they understand that they are, are influential community. No, we are talking about the job, whether volunteer has to be a job. Um, my question for you will be, is a citizen a job? Yeah, we don't get remuneration for citizenship. In order to support our government, our country, our homeland, we all become volunteers. And uh, there are volunteers who work 24-7 in order to help other people, and they don't have other resources. Do they have the right to get remuneration? Of course they do. When we are talking about institutionalization of volunteer movement, we keep emphasizing it. you have to do it professionally and then you will be rewarded. Of course, it contradicts the term volunteer in the classic understanding, but when we are talking about volunteer movement, I don't see any volunteers who are lawyers, I don't see volunteers who are teachers, uh, who worked with uh, uh, victims from uh, uh, communities who suffered the most and who uh, made sure that they were integrated into the community. Volunteers, in our understanding, are those who help the armed forces of Ukraine. But volunteer is uh, a much broader uh, in, in this sense. So these are those who are ready to help. Yeah, we are talking about the obstacles we need to overcome in order to ins get to institutionalization. The society sees us differently depending on what sort of uh, experience they had and who they cooperated with among volunteer organizations, and this experience can be very, very different. We also know that some volunteers uh, uh, went missing and they uh, took the money with them and they took the bank card with them. Therefore, it's important uh, to make sure that there is uh, transparency, uh, openness and accountability. When you're helping anybody on voluntary basis, you are a volunteer because this is what you do and this is your goodwill. Once you get remuneration, you become an employee. We are not saying that this is bad, but this is an employee. Let's not call employees volunteers because um, there are people who are helping for many years uh, and this is their sincere position so they either help internally displaced people they help the uh, armed forces of ukraine they deserve certain reputation and authority but there are also people who want to make money on that and they say we are also volunteers so that's great image but let's call a spade a spade if there is a charity organization 
that is working uh, with volunteers. It's, it's normal. There is administration of the non-governmental organization. Uh, I'm, I'll give you an example of my uh, organization. We restore, for example, ancient church. We have uh, staff of our organization. We have accountant, we have a manager, and they get paid for their job. But we also involve volunteers who help us restore this old wooden church. Does that mean that we have to pay them remuneration? No. They are sincere in their desire to help. So we should call them volunteers. The others we call staff or employees. It's not name calling. It's not uh, offending anybody that you work better because you get paid. There are employees of foundations, employees of charity organizations, of voluntary movement. So they do great job and we have to pay tribute to them. We have to give them the credit that they became professionals. They help and they do a lot. But should we call them volunteers? Do we really need to come up with a new word, a new definition, a new term? Uh, it's back to linguistics. Let's, let's get back to linguistics. It's okay. Words tend to um, change their meaning and acquire new meaning, acquire new connotation. So when we are talking about um, um, this and this is a, a acute discussion, so let's sit down, let's create some joint uh, group, joint uh, task force and come up with a new word. But I don't see why we should do that. There is no problem here. When you're trying to explain to Americans and we say that are Ukrainian volunteers, they say, are you a military volunteer? So they ask us, uh, what sort of volunteer are you? Are you meeting people in the railway station? I say, no, this is a different uh, group of volunteers. So uh, we can use different names. It might make sense, but Do volunteers get any privileges uh, because they are called volunteers? Uh, what I'm talking about is that people who are volunteers and who get remuneration and who make career as a volunteer, so that's a totally different thing. The head of fundraising department uh, of um, Comeback Alive Foundation, Oleg Karpenko, he posted on Twitter um, the message that we need volunteers. But people, uh, the first question they asked, how much do you pay? And he tried to explain that it's the idea, it's the cause that comes first, money comes second. We are now only talking theoretically about volunteer movement, uh, what's the ideal picture, and whether it makes sense to come up with new words, new mechanisms, etc. Uh, personally, I don't see any problems. I don't see um, uh, any issues. So once we remain transparent and public, sometimes um, some communities approached us and they say we need to cover utility bills and we were helping them. Okay, let's talk about salary. Salary is the market. So there should be some employees. They have to have some qualifications. They have to have job uh, duties and responsibilities and they get their salary. When we are talking about volunteers, we are talking about covering their expenses, their daily needs to buy food, to pay utility bills, and to have the bed, to have roof uh, over their head. I used to work in business, in commercial institutions, but for me, it's very important. Uh, the quality of the work I do is very important. When I open the center of psychological consultation, for me, it's important not to harm, not to hurt. Therefore, I opt for mental health providers with qualifications, with degree. Those psychologists can spend a few hours a day, but if I have, for example, a person who has been through deep trauma and it's important that one psychologist works with that person during the whole course and uh, 
I'm ready to find the money to pay this professional psychologist so that he helps this pa patient rather than I change psychologists for this person. Uh, you understand that sometimes there are people who are in charge of procurement. You say, we need a helmet or we need a tourniquet. And they know what quality, what type, what price, that this tourniquet has to be certified and not just made in some local garage. So, and people who are professional who do it on daily basis in a quality manner if we compensate their expenses for example their bus ticket and uh, their grocery bills and their utility bills i believe that that will be more beneficial to us uh, Otherwise, uh, we will end up having tourniquets that are made in a garage, uh, and this is just a stripe uh, of um, uh, some ribbon with a, with a stick. Um, you probably know that instead of buying Bayraktars that we collected money, we bought the satellite. Um, and we are going to post pictures soon, and I believe that this is going to be great, and our Russian adversary are not going to be happy out of that. Uh, can volunteers who don't have certain qualifications, competences, experience buy a satellite? No. Do we have to cultivate it? Unfortunately, yes, given today's circumstances. We started talking about mental health providers. Um, of course, we cannot involve people who are not physicians and who, are not, uh, who don't have a clue about the health care. Our volunteers who are physicians, so they have their jobs, they uh, do their shift during the day, they do the shift with us during the night. We have lots of partners who work in different uh, uh, areas, different sectors, uh, some, for example, buy disposable cups uh, or find a better price for discos disposable cups, uh, disposable plates, etc. So sometimes we are multitaskers and we are multidisciplinary experts. So we do a lot of things. I believe that... Um, People who are great volunteers, who make great volunteers, are people who have a previous job experience. And also their mindset is, uh, shows the readiness. Sometimes when we don't have resources, we don't have people. But people come, they join our movement, they offer to do what they are good at. We are also trying to cover some of their expenses. We are not talking about salaries here. It's just covering their basic expenses. I just want to assure you that today I've seen a different level of volunteers. These are people who are in their 60s. Some of them, they run their own businesses. We had volunteers from uh, Kiev. Uh, these were owners of businesses and they were carrying those wounded uh, uh, evacuees. Sometimes we had... Um, parents coming with their children and their children were minors and they were involving those children into volunteer movements. I just uh, wanted to make sure that the mother understands what she does. She says, yes, I want my child to be aware, to be a patriot, and I want them to do what I am doing. I believe that uh, initiatives accompany the processes that were not envisaged until today. We gathered experts who are ready to contribute, but there are a few principles. The first is professionalism. Second is readiness, because we who work at the railway station, we are working for 12 hours. It's against uh, labor principles and uh, rules. The, the doctor normally works between 10 to 5. Uh, um, the teachers work uh, a certain amount of hours. But with us, they stay much longer. Sometimes we also need uh, basic things like paper, pens, pencils, etc. And we involve our partners who work in those sectors. So they are also volunteers. They offer us some of the supplies, but they do not 
put a surcharge on these supplies. Um, what you said is absolutely right. For example, there is one foundation that had been working in Ukraine for a long time. This is Renaissance Foundation. Did they work as volunteers for 20 years? No, but they never called themselves volunteers. Come Back Alive Foundation is also uh, not a volunteer foundation. We are talking about different things. There are volunteer organizations, there are organizations that are professional who gather volunteers. There is, for example, Ukrainian Voluntary Service. Uh, there is pro bono organization that uh, gathers professional volunteers and they work with volunteer concept for a long time. And this was, that was not military volunteer movement. That was lawyers volunteer, volunteer movement. So they work with a slightly different uh, aspect. I forgot what I wanted to say. I responded to what you were saying and I forgot what I wanted to say. Let me say that um, we need to talk about volunteers, uh, volunteer movement because it's becoming very diversified. You are right. There is also another issue that I wanted to raise. When we are talking about volunteers, what do we mean by that? Now I remember what I wanted to say. We did uh, the survey among our partners. These are non-governmental organizations that uh, help uh, uh, humanitarian mission uh, with supplies and provisions. Our partners, 80% of them, these are organizations who've never been involved in humanitarian relief or humanitarian assistance. 25%, these are those who did it according to their statute. My question is the following. Are you going to continue doing what you are doing? Yes, but we will also get back to what is part of our statutory activity. So we are talking about those who will be looking for volunteers who will be working as employees, but also there will be humanitarian component, those who will be working as volunteers without any remuneration. In Kharkiv, Chernihiv region today, there are no people who can work as professional volunteers and the government unfortunately cannot rebuild all this with the pace that we would love it to rebuild. We are talking about Ukrainian government and uh, legislation. There is also the registry of volunteers in the legislation. There are all sorts of things. Yeah, remember Cossacks? They were also registered and non-registered Cossacks. You are right. There are also people who call themselves volunteers, but they don't know that there is a law on volunteers. So therefore, I'm afraid that after we finish this discussion, lots of people will say, oh, they don't pay me money. I'm not volunteering anymore. Why do I need it? On the contrary, volunteer is a synonym to a citizen in our country, in our homeland. Everybody can be involved and can contribute today. Not all volunteers get uh, the compensation my colleagues were talking about, uh, although the comp compensation should be provided for. The question is, how can we make those who want to work, work those who want to volunteer, that they can volunteer, those who want to do it professionally, let them do it professionally, up to you. And the third block is about the satellite. Yeah, you, you mentioned satellite, but let's remind ourselves that our government launched one satellite that got lost very, very soon. Let's talk about the government. After six years, the government is also trying to institutionalize or create some boundaries or create some rules for volunteers. Are they creating obstacles or are they helping, hampering or helping or hindering? Once I heard um, one phrase which was really hurtful, but it makes sense. When the government wants something from you, so they start calling themselves homeland. Unfortunately, government is not equal to homeland, not always. And volunteers, they help their homeland. They don't help their government. They don't help their leadership. They don't help 
political parties, though we know that there are political volunteer organizations, but that's a total different thing. I believe that volunteers are those who help their motherland, homeland, but not always uh, the interests of volunteers and the desire to help their homeland is perceived normally by the government. And not always the government helps uh, the volunteer activity. We all know who does what. Even those who started working half a year ago, so we understand what they do. So their activity got crystallized. And um, there are lists of registered volunteers who should be registered. Where, for example, today I talked uh, with the private bank. We were talking about 100,000 hryvnias a month. And they say, yes, uh, you can... Um, apply for this assistance, but it'll take ages. So where does the government help us? Did they reveal some uh, um, people, some uh, imposters who call themselves volunteers? We keep doing what we are doing, so we keep buying things and sending them to the front line to help our soldiers. Unfortunately, there is no understanding as of today of what volunteer movement is or what is non-governmental assistance to the armed forces of Ukraine, be it volunteer assistance or foundation assistance. I would like to unite them here because both are helping the armed forces. But the government is just helping the selected people, those who they love and who they cherish or they want to use somehow. But there is no total understanding of what volunteer movement is or what is non-governmental assistance to the armed forces of Ukraine. According to me, there is no government separately and me separately. I vote. I pay taxes. I make a choice whether to offer a bribe or not to offer a bribe. The government we see today and the, the, the country we see today, this is also my responsibility and this is what we make it. I will be honest with you. Do we have problems? Yes, we do. Are there problems with volunteer movement? Yes. Is there a problem with communication and cooperation? Yes. We are not going to pretend that everything is perfect in our garden, that there are no problems. There are problems, of course. But I'd like to see it as, for example, there is a problem you need to fix. Uh, you need to make arrangements, you need to raise questions, you need to make changes into the legislation. We need to see it as some kind of change in the system. So there has to be the change in the system. Any process, any mechanism um, has to be improved. There is always the room for perfection. And uh, we cannot just uh, avoid responsibility. Let's ask ourselves honestly, have you been paying taxes fully and honestly all your life? Uh, did you vote in every election? Did you work hard? You may say I was not on the list, but did you make sure you are on the list? Uh, did you check uh, what sort of laws the um, members of parliament you elected voted for? I know lots of people who avoided the service in the army, who avoided being drafted. May I say something here? When we were talking about the personal responsibility, my son, he's uh, in the internship, his first year of internship. Um, he's a young um, doctor, doctor to be. And um, they were talking about, with his friends, the personal responsibility for their health. We started an ish initiative which is called Hear Your Doctor. That was just an initiative. We thought that um, it will be embraced. And we decided to go to schools and uh, we involved uh, young doctors. My role was to find them, to make arrangements with them. And we went to schools and we were delivering lectures to school children. What you can do today and what is your role and responsibility so that you are healthy, that you stay and uh, get educated here. You don't need to go to Poland or other countries. You can choose your job here. There were some 
teachers who stayed with their school children and they agreed to volunteer. There were some teachers who said that my day is over and I'm not going to stay here. Uh, there were also people who joined me later in the railway station in volunteer uh, activity. And there were also doctors uh, who were who took this responsibly and they also joined me later at the railway station. And when we realized in May that we are missing the road map, we got in small tips and we were um, knocking on the doors of each and every governmental department demanding what we need. I understand that what's happening in Lviv and what's happening in other small towns, these are to totally do different sit things. The key thing here is resources. Sometimes we don't have enough resources. So when we are talking about the government, the country, so we are also talking about personal responsibility. We need to talk about things. We need to discuss things. It's not always easy, but when we have such communities, it's easy. Let's draw a parallel with the internet or cryptocurrency. For example, people invented something and then the government uh, steps in and say, we need to uh, introduce law and order here. So the question is as simple as that. Is the government helping or hindering? So where exactly are they still helping? Are they hindering? I don't like to take the side of the government. I don't like to defend them, but the government does what they have to do according to their understanding. Unfortunately, we don't have uh, institutional memory of uh, societal processes and uh, community processes so that we know what to do in each particular case. The government, um, th there are a lot of things we can criticize the government for, but they also do their work. They do what they can do. We also do what we can do. We work hard, but let's be honest, the government does a lot. Probably we cannot even assess the scope and scale of our work. Um, I know that the Ministry of Defense also does a lot. There is a lot to criticize them for, but I also think very highly of them. I'm not going to be very critical. I'm not talking about criticism. I'm just talking about this fine line where they help or where they hinder. I may like it or I may not like, like it, but the government has to step in because we are talking about money, a lot of money. So there are a lot of banking transactions with different sorts of currencies. Maybe the government doesn't want to pay attention to that. They want to turn a blind eye, but they step in and pay attention. These are the foundational things. There are processes um, uh, that have to be controlled because otherwise it will be dangerous. Remember the situation with the National Bank a while ago. Everybody understood theoretically why we do that. Maybe, uh, may I clarify something? When we are talking about big foundations, you are also talking about small funds, and they are also from the same environment. When the government creates favorable conditions only for big foundations and uh, hinders small foundations, what's going to happen? When we are talking about small uh, volunteers, I'm not talking about funds because legal entities that are registered as charity foundation, they have totally different situation. They don't have problems. When I'm talking about small volunteers. I'm talking about physical entities, those who donate money either to our account or to our bank card. If you have institutional structure and you have the certificate saying that you are non-for-profit organization, you have the statute, you have the head of organization, you have the accountant, you have different problems. It's not the, the, the disaster that we face. You're not, we, you're not doing the procurement, invoicing, etc. When we are Talking about uh, non-regulated cash flow, money flow, whether we want it or not, the government has to step, step in. Same thing as uh, with the cryptocurrency. Yes, the governments had to step in because there are good people who are here in this room on this stage, but there are also malignant people. There are also bad actors, and we probably all know them. Therefore, it's unavoidable. 
And the question to the government, not to us, uh, I agree with you, and I'll be honest, that they have to initiate the dialogue with us, and they have to admit us to the dialogue. Because I believe that there will be changes to legislation about the charity activity, because the law was introduced in 1998, and I believe that they will have to step in. We will have to step in, and they will have to hear us and accept our position. Their problem is that they do not always hear us, and their excuse is war is going on in the country. There is no time for that. But we are not against transparency, publicity. We are not against the governmental control and framework understanding where our competencies, rights, and responsibilities end or begin. But we need to talk about these things. We are ready to talk to them. Whether they are ready to talk to us, that's another question. Sometimes I have a feeling that we are discussing whether the government is an evil or a necessary service. And when we are talking about the volunteer movement, uh, what the government should be here in this paradigm? I don't have a clear answer to this question. I, under I think that Ukrainians have their own unique answer and they uh, are not trying to enter this uh, world global paradigm. I wanted to say something else here. So the government is uh, the authority, the regulator, and they have to regulate what money has to be accumulated, what money has to go where, where it has to, chan to be channeled, and whether it's channeled for the good, how to make sure that there is effective communication between governmental institutions that receive things or donate things or receive donations from charity organizations, donor organizations, etc. Because um, we cannot donate just to one community uh, only because they can communicate things perfectly. So this is also the work of the government to make sure that cost is distributed evenly, money is distributed evenly. I think that the government has to take care of one thing, and it's really alarming to me. They need to... Uh, for example, there are uh, regular checks of security services of Ukraine, so they check charity foundations, volunteer organizations, etc. It's important that they do not undermine the trust to volunteer movement, because there is a serious challenge. There are people who do not trust the government, who do not trust our re leadership. Therefore, um, funds were created, charity organizations were created, and people can donate money. So people are not ready to donate to the government, but they are ready to donate to the charity foundation because the government is not flexible. There are a lot of questions that we need to ask to our government. The government has to have control function, control button. And I'm, I agree that they have to control things, but they cannot blame, for example, well-known uh, funds, volunteers, because they paralyze their work so they can recover their service, they can uh, seize their assets, uh, and uh, they, they come to check their activity for no reason. Sometimes we know the reasons why they check their activities. When we are talking about the security issue, so it's important that Ukraine takes care of the trust to volunteer movement. And what's missing here is the good leadership position and also a good organization inside volunteer organizations. So what Melanka was talking about, that the government has to hear us. And in order to for them to hear us, we have to have a collective voice. So networking inside is also important in this circle. Another thing is, uh, I believe that now we are talking about military assistance mainly prevailingly, and uh, this is what we've been doing since 2014. But when we are talking about humanitarian assistance, humanitarian needs, back in 2014, we didn't have such needs. So this is unprecedented case. We haven't had experience. We haven't had institutional knowledge. And a lot of people who are addressing humanitarian issues, so they face new things, and uh, they need to know how to deliver things from other countries, what are the uh, customs clearance procedures, 
procedures, what are the border crossing procedures, etc. And for example, I was really surprised that every car that delivers commodity from abroad, they had to have a special permission letter from the military regional administration. But when we are talking that this is humanitarian assistance that um, is delivered for certain volunteer organization or volunteer uh, initiative, the government also has to know who this commodity is for. And I think that it will inevitably lead to creation of the registry. And uh, we need to know that this is an organization that is reliable, that is delivering uh, humanitarian aid and not a pair of designer shoes that will be sold in the black market here. And I believe that this is the issue of trust that we have to work on all together. There are a lot of risks today because there are certain things um, that are missing, some rules uh, haven't been perfected or haven't been uh, defined clearly. Some people have access to the government, some are hurt, some are not. I believe that this dialogue has to be open and it has to be transparent and it has to be um, available to everybody and those organizations that work for their community, who help uh, armed forces of Ukraine, who help rebuilding the country, who help with humanitarian relief, who help rebuilding the de deoccupied territories, they also deserve to be heard. You summarized very well that back in 2015, there was a suggestion that there are non-governmental organizations, there are charity organizations. You can make changes into the legislation and make volunteer organizations. It wasn't beneficial, it wasn't profitable, but I believe it would have helped to address a lot of issues. And charity organizations would remain charity organizations, volunteer organizations would remain volunteer organizations. My last question for you, and please take one minute to answer. What are the main trends of development of volunteer movement in the nearest future? For example, we are talking about half a year. And how it's going to change? One minute each. For some people, half a year is a lot of time. What is the planning horizon? I'm optimistic. I believe that after Ukraine wins this war, we will get back to our normal lives. Some people will stay with volunteer movement, some will go back to economy, teaching, restoration, etc. I think that the volunteer is the ideal model of the uh, government, of the statehood. I, I disagree. We can discuss the terminology. We can have uh, some disputes uh, about the threshold, about the boundaries, etc. Let's not stop. If you want to volunteer, volunteer. If you want to get remuneration, please do. If you want to get compensation of your expenses, please do. But do something for your homeland, for the government. Become part of this victory. Become part of Ukraine's success. From my experience, I should say that there are a lot of young people who joined us in March. They didn't have idea what is the administrative services center, how to cross the border, where you can get your documents issued, and what is the single registry of governmental institutions. They were just living their normal life outside the, the government technicalities. The moment when they started accompanying people and they started talking to these people, we were instructing them very clearly where this person is heading, how to cross the border, whether they will be uh, provided medical health care. And uh, I believe that people were really stressed, those who arrived in railway station, and uh, we needed to involve uh, our mental health providers to help these people. Therefore, this volunteer movement also helped these young people understand the role of our country, of our government. We also come across uh, different uh, civil servants. We also teach people how to formulate correctly, how to uh, justify correctly. So volunteers have to be professional people, not just uh, luggage carriers. And uh, they need to explain what to do. And uh, when they are well informed, then they also help mental health providers because they don't need to do that much work. I believe that um, those communities that are working today, so um, 
they are really sincere and they will keep their communication they will be transformed we don't need to necessarily follow certain rules and we do not need to follow artificial situations we need to be present we do things we see the challenge we can delegate sometimes uh, this challenge to somebody we can contribute our time our resources ourselves you mentioned the word professional volunteer movement so this is when you do things effectively you do what you are good at and it's not about the money you keep donating but you also need to pay for the bus ticket in order to arrive at where you have to be depending on what we see in the country i believe that there is now the whole wave of people who are not indifferent and who have been doing things for months andre mentioned that they've been doing things for years since 2014 and people who join us in what we do so they were all active back in 2014 it means that we have the history of good sustainable volunteer movement and these people are getting um, more and more united we have the head of our military unit of our foundation, Roman Sinitsin. He's been working since 2014 and he said he always keeps saying that things are going to get worse. And I agree. Um, things will be bad uh, until Russia exists um, uh, and we will always be busy until Russia exists. I think that it was mid-March, we had a meeting in our foundation and I remember saying that it's not a sprint, it's a marathon, so we have to be prepared to run long and it's going to be tiring. We've been running for six months and I think that we are all tired. We want to approach our victory, but our victory is not around the corner, unfortunately. Now we need to think how to involve young people, new people, how to offer a second wind to our teams, how to get tuned in to a long run, because I'm not going to get back to media business anytime soon. It's not going to happen tomorrow. And I have to accept it. We have to take care of ourselves, especially our mental health. I never thought that mental health is important uh, until I burned out. And I think that uh, mental health is important for volunteers, for professionals, and I think this is going to be another major stage of their functioning, because if we all are tired and if we all stop working, I believe this is not going to be good for anybody. When I'm analyzing the six months, looking back at six months, I think... Um, Ukrainian volunteers, Ukrainian people, Ukrainian charity foundations. So this is the big war machine. It's a one great war machine. It's the star of death. I believe that everything is okay. When we only started this activity and uh, why we picked up the name Lviv's Night, and my, one of my colleagues said that we need to come up with the slogan because we are knights. We came up with the slogan that the war is uh, about everybody and the victory depends on everybody. And I remember when we were in Rinox Square with the Saint uh, George and we, we had to uh, make a statement about uh, our activity and uh, they say, okay, the start date, there should be end date and the end date, we, we, I remember we put down until the victory. I wanted to say what Malanka said, that uh, people are going to suffer from fatigue and uh, exhaustion and tiredness uh, sometime soon. But positively speaking, uh, everybody needs to define their own limits. 
we are probably be looking for our normalcy we will probably be getting back to our professional life but partially they will also be involved in volunteer movement for us it will be structured volunteer movement it's going to be a trend but it also means that uh, we will need some replacement and i believe that more and more people will get involved in this movement thank you very much for your optimism we were talking about volunteer movement uh, i believe that we could have talked more and longer but let me just um, remind you who our guests uh, today were um, Melania Podolak, coordinator and manager of the NEST project of Serhii Protulas Foundation in Lviv. Andriy Saluk, a volunteer and founder of Lviv's Night Civil Civic Initiative. Halina Burdun, advisor of the head of Lviv Oblast Military Administration, chair of the Medical and Psychological Support Working Group. And Evelina Kurilets, executive director of Razum for Ukraine uh, Charity Foundation. And Oksana Daszczakivska, head of the regional office of the International Renaissance.